Perfect. Uh, well, welcome everyone. It's pretty exciting. We've got uh, quite a few academy participants and a couple adventure uh, folks who've uh, who've signed up for the training as well. Um, and uh, yeah, so we'll jump right into it. We're gonna today's session is gonna be about uh, what to expect, um, how we go about training for that expectation, and then. Um, at the end, we'll just look at some uh, the first week of uh, the training for the academy, so we can kind of answer any questions that anyone might have. Um, if uh, you guys have questions throughout, you can jump in, uh, and if it's not doesn't seem like it's a good place to jump in, write them down, and then we'll we'll do a Q and A at the end. Uh, so the the little bar there at the bottom kind of sums it up: says train hard and suffer less. Um, uh, you know, hike and fly racing is hard and it, it short races, long races, they're always hard. Um, and, and one of the reasons we're doing the Academy is the, uh, response last year from quite a few participants was like, wow, that was really hard. We didn't think it was going to be that hard. Um, and, uh, and so we wanted to provide some training to make it maybe a little more fun uh, and a little less painful. Um, so, we got here what to expect uh, during the X Red Rocks. Um, so this is by day uh, academy. You know, your your routes are going to be a little shorter. Minimum 3,000 to 4,500 feet of elevation gain daily, probably even a little more, and uh, 10 to 15 miles walking on the roads or trails. Um, and you're going to do that for three days in a row. Um, adventure. You can see the number jumps up quite a bit, six to 8,000 feet of gain with 15 to 20 miles. And, you know, what you're looking at there for the adventure folks is that's a minimum of likely two large hikes. Um, and uh, and then the the kind of beginning and end daily walk. Uh, we had a joke in the X Alps that everything was a thousand meters to get to. And if it wasn't a thousand meters, it was 2000 meters. Um, and uh, uh, Monroe's kind of the same way. It's uh, it's big relief to get up to where you can launch in a lot of places. Um, so those of you who haven't done races like this, it's not a thousand feet a lot of times in in Monroe. It's uh, they're they're monster hikes. So you're gonna need to put the work in to be able to handle that. Um, cold heat, nutritional hydration challenges. You know, all these things you should prepare and train for. Um, we can have some mega hot days out in Monroe, and we can also have some pretty pretty cold days that can be taxing in their own way. Um, heat training's real. If you don't live in a place that gets hot, um, try and figure out how to do some sweating in your training. It'll make a big difference on those hot days. And then the biggest thing is just that you've trained it, you know, uh, when you need to eat, when you need to drink, when you need to stop and take care of your feet. And that's a, a massively important part of all of this. And we'll have another talk down the road about nutrition and hydration and, and whatnot. Um, I think the last bullet points, the really important one, which is, you know, sliding up to launch just like a beat dog and, and uh, thinking you're going to perform well is not realistic. Um, you need to show up be able to pull your kid out, kind of set yourself, feel good and aware and, and have a safe launch, a safe flight and a safe landing. And if you don't train well, um, you're not going to have that headspace when you get to launch after a big hike in the heat. Um, so anyone have any uh, questions on, on the expectations of, of racing? Cool. Uh, all right. So the kind of core principles that, that, uh, we are going to work under, um, start with building a sport specific aerobic base. That's word salad for, um, you need to do your sport. Um, so biking is great and you should do some of that and, you know, running is great and helpful, but you need to hike with a pack and you need to build a, a good aerobic base. And we'll talk about how you do that. Um, the kind of simple answer is you got to hike a lot. Um, so 
put that in your mind that that putting on a pack and going uphill or getting in the gym on a stairmaster is going to need to be your friend if you want to be well prepared to do this sport. Um, we're going to use some strength training, and we're going to do that to build uh, some durability, um, and more on that in a minute. But that's you know helps you when you bounce or have a crappy landing or, or trip and fall or anything like that. So we want to be durable so that we don't, we don't break when we hit the ground uh, and then build some athleticism. Um, so much of our sport is not athletic, but it's amazing how athletic you need to be on a, on a windy takeoff or coming into land and trying to dodge a cactus or, or getting blown backwards. So there's times where we need to be athletic and, um, and I kind of define that as the ability to move quickly uh, and be able to change direction. And a lot of that gets lost when all you do is, is do endurance training. So Jim's going to kind of help us with that stuff. Uh, frequent long training days are key. Um, you got to go long to go long. So we're going to do that in the training as well. Uh, road walking, uh, same thing, got to train it. If, if all you do is hike in the mountains and then you got a day with 20 miles on the roads, your feet and shoulders are going to get real unhappy in your hips and everything else. So um, it's boring as hell. Gavin can attest to having done a billion miles of road walking and training, but it pays off because when, when you have to do it, it's just no big deal. It's just it's like breathing. You just get after it. Um, mobility and self-care. These are mandatory concepts. Um, we're going to get into how you do it, but, um, you got to take care of yourself that allows you to train, allows you to recover from training and allows you to perform well on, on race day, uh, recovery allows for adaptation. What that means is you have to rest. So we can't be chronically training. We need to take recovery weeks. We need to have rest days throughout the week where we're not, uh, out there punishing ourselves. Cause that's when your body, uh, recovers from the you know shock of the training that you gave it and it and it tries to get better so that they won't hurt as bad the next time uh, but recovery is the only way that that's going to happen and then last is consistency pays more dividends than infrequent but harder work um, you know the allure of crushing yourself is you know it it, it has a feel-good component you feel like you did something good but we need to be smart about our training, first of all. And then the other part is just being consistent is the most important thing. Um, and you, you can't, you know, not do six days of training and train two days, but make the two days really hard. You're not going to get the same effect. So got to make time in your life to, uh, uh, to make these things happen. So we, uh, we talked about the sport specific aerobic base. Um, and the top one's kind of the key component, which is, um, says aerobic versus anaerobic. Most people train with too high of a heart rate most of the time. Um, and there's a ton of good research. Um, the, uh, uh, uh cross country skiers have become a, kind of the gold standard for, for research and, and uh, all the Olympic cross country skiers, they do like 92 to 4% of their training at what they call an easy pace. Um, and most people find it too slow. Part of that's because they're not all that fit. And then they think it's not effective. So then they train harder. And really, we need to do a ton of this aerobic level um training for for the heart rate nerds out there that's like your classic z2 stuff um and it just can't be overstated that 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 is the foundation that the everything's built on the anaerobic work the interval stuff we do need to do too but i like to think of that as is the seasoning for the meal um and you got to sprinkle it in uh you've got to dose it you should know what it's like to go at 100% or 80%, uh, but it, it shouldn't be the basis of, of your training. So again, that's back to that. You shouldn't feel smashed every day when you're done training. Um, the word sport specific in there. So I put under load in mountainous terrain. Um, we move with our pack on, on 
steep and variable terrain. And uh, again, you can't you can't never train with a pack because you like running and then think you're going to put that pack on and feel good. It's got to be become your second skin. You got to get used to it. And then moving up steep terrain, um, it's very different than again like running on on rolling hills. Um, when it gets steep and you haven't trained, you're going to start to feel it. Your calves are going to blow out. Your feet are going to hurt. So um, we need to do the best we can to get in that terrain. That being said, um, Eduardo Garza trained for 2X Alps and 3X peers living in Boston. Uh, and he's a he's an animal. And we had him on a stair mill. And it was miserable. And he wanted to freaking jump off a, a building every day because uh, it was so boring. But it works. You can also do step ups. You can run stairs or hike stairs in a tall building if you live in a skyscraper. There's lots of ways to do it, but you got to find something that makes it somewhat look and feel like you're you're hiking up a mountain. Um, I put the muscular endurance phase in there, and we'll talk about that a little bit. But that's I just wanted to make note that while it is so much of this uh, kind of base aerobic stuff. We also want to get the muscles ready for uh, the beating you're going to take. And this, these muscular endurance phases is what what we do there is is um, we're going to try and have you come out of a three or four week block pretty much sore every day um, and semi miserable. And that uh, adaptation that your body's going to get, like the special sauce uh, that's going to let you move faster in the mountains. So. Uh, I was just throwing that in there for when we get there and you curse my name that uh, I warned you. Um, heart rate stuff. Uh, so at the end of that says RPE, that's rate of perceived exertion. Um, we're going to, you're going to find that in all the training. And as an example, um, this aerobic zone that we're talking about is like a five out of 10. And the way to the thing you got to remember when we look forward into the training is um, it's all relative to the time or distance that you're going. So a nine of 10 pace in a marathon is very different than a nine of 10 pace in a 400 sprint. Um, so you take whatever the RPE is that I gave you, apply it to how long or, or big you're doing the particular training and, and that's what it, it should feel like. Um, you can use heart rate stuff. Um, 180 minus your age is kind of the classic standard for that aerobic zone. Um, if you're into using a strap, um, we will provide heart rate zones as well. Um, but there's a, it's amazing. There's a whole bunch of other studies that show that using RPE is as effective at, as, uh, staring at your heart rates. So, uh, and then uh, last one says 90 minutes is a sweet spot. So at around 90 minutes uh, or a little before is where uh, that true aerobic um, uh, adaptation takes place and your body starts looking for, uh, it, it tends to run out of glycogen stores. So the, the, the glycogen is what initially um, powers your muscles. It starts looking for fat as fuel. Um, it's where hydration starts becoming an issue. So all of the things that are going to come at you, uh, racing, um, you're, you don't really deal with until you start nearing 90 minutes. So you're going to see a lot of workouts after we get going that are in that 90 minute zone. Um, and it's intentional that it's, it's there and not at like an hour. Um, an hour is often just not quite long enough to, uh, to, to drive the adaptation that we're looking for. Anyone got any questions on, on this uh, piece? Yeah, thanks, Ben. Um, going to the RPE, is, is that something that, that you said is, is just totally kind of a, a mental metric or is there a way of kind of tracking that with devices as well? Um, it's really more of a mental metric um, and it gets, it, it gets less of a mental metric and you can do it more with devices after you've done it enough to know what, what yours is. So, you know, you might know that for you, um, that you can do 
a thousand feet of vertical ascent in 30 minutes and it's pretty it, you know it's that five to ten effort it's not hard um and so you can use those kind of metrics once you know um where you are uh but that'll the big thing about rpe is it's different for everyone so um you might be able to do two thousand feet in 30 minutes and it feel like a five to ten effort does that right. sort of answer that question yeah thank you All right, uh, let's move on. If I can make this thing work. There we go. Uh, strength training. Um, the gym is a tool. Uh, we're not here to set um, any strength records in the gym. And you will find that the training I give uh, that involves strength stuff is not going to have any particular weight numbers attached to it. It's going to say something like do a goblet squat five times. You're going to choose what that feels like. Um, and what my guidance is there is, is uh, it is a tool. So you're, you're there to get some gains out of it, but you're not there to um, be crippled the next day um, and not be able to do the next day's training uh, you're not there certainly to hurt yourself in the gym. And, you know, if you've never trained strength training, you are going to see some strength improvements, which is super cool. If you're trained strength training for a long time on these kinds of programs, you shouldn't really see any gains in the gym. It should be more like maintenance work. Um, so just remember what you're using it for and that, you know, the next day, if you've got a big hike, uh, coming up that you should go into that feeling good, not like you overdid it in the gym. Um, strong bodies with some muscle are more durable. So uh, that bottom picture is me after uh, I had a really nice landing. And uh, the doctor said, well, you should be paralyzed, but you're not because your back was strong enough that the muscle held uh, the spinal cord together after I vaporized a uh, um, uh, uh, one of my, uh, uh, vertebrae. So I bring that up because, you know, even if you don't hammer it in, we're all, we've all had hard landings and you're going to have more and you are going to, like I said, trip and fall, you're going to have to run something out and blow it. And so having a little bit of muscle on your body is a useful thing, uh, for when you, when you pound and then it's also um just useful for that just general durability of 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 you know you put your arm out um again you know on a hard landing or something that you don't dislocate your shoulder um that you can fly longer and your 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 shoulders don't hurt so um being a little bit strong is a good thing um most people are uh guaranteed to have excess body fat before they're going to have excess muscle so you know an elite marathoner we're talking about a different conversation but for most of us we could definitely stand to put a little bit of muscle on and and replace uh, a little bit of body fat so the gym's your friend it'll help you do that um that being said i said we carry our engine the goal is not to get uh you know, to put on a bunch of weight because we do have to carry our engine. And so if you got 15 extra pounds that don't add to how fast you can move up the mountain, um, then you're not doing yourself any favors. Uh, and that's whether it's muscle or fat. Um, when we get into um, strength work, um, I say stick to the basics. I think in the, in the world of CrossFit and everything else everyone wants these fun exciting super varied workouts and uh and that's great but it's not needed um taking the the classic simple movements um that's the most important thing uh that's how you're going to get strong it's good to repeat them do repeatable workouts um and you then have the ability to work on your form to get better at it uh, which then leads to more strength gains with less soreness. Um, so 
you know, we'll have a decent variety, but um, whether you're training on your own or training with me, um, the basics are where it's at. Um, when I walk into my gym uh, and I don't know what the plan is, I tend to just do something basic like squats and pull-ups and then, um, and I get a lot of benefit out of it. So uh, I think that's the right way to go for, for people training endurance sports. Um, and then we, we already talked about the athleticism piece. Um, and that's where we'll, we might do some, some jumping, some, some, uh, um, you know, kettlebell swings, some things with some explosive nature to them that'll, that'll add to that athleticism. Anyone got any, uh, questions on strength training? No. Cool. Um, we are for the Academy folks. Um, we're going to have two options. Uh, every strength session, one of them will be hundred percent body weight, something you can just do in your living room. And then another one will be based around being in the gym. So, uh, don't get freaked out that you got to go turn into a gym rat, or if you're, I saw someone in their van and, uh, you'll be able to still get some good benefits, uh, without having to, to join a gym. Ben, I guess I would maybe add to that the, uh, you know, until I met you, I, I had, 20 years of pretty serious pain after nine knee surgeries over the years with all my ski racing stuff. And, you know, I'm pretty convinced that the mobility and the, and the, uh, weight training was the thing that, you know, I mean, I haven't had any knees, knee pain since I started working with you. So for those of you who are thinking, you know, what am I, what am I doing getting into this? I don't have the, the right physique or the you know, pain, or you've got injuries from the past, you know, you're working with Ben can, can really help uh, alleviate a lot of that kind of stuff. And then the other thing I would say is that a lot of people don't lift very well in the gym. You know, if you haven't done much lifting or, you know, a squat can be, you know, done poorly is, is, is pretty ugly. So, you know, get some help if you're not really sure. You, there's there's people in your gyms, wherever you are, that can, that can help a lot with technique. There's, it's a good idea to get coaching. Yeah, I'll totally second that. And, and it's great. You can, you can go to, you know, you can hire a personal trainer for just one or two sessions and be like, I would just want you to teach me how to do these six things. Um, and then you can go do it on your own. Um, and you bring up a good point, you know, I'll, I'll have folks who, you know, they'll be having something going on with their knee and they're like, oh, I don't want to squat. It's like, well, what we actually need you to do is to squat. Um, the squatting is not the cause of your knee pain, but it can help alleviate it once we get some strength in and get you through a full range of motion. That all being said, to Gavin's point, you got to do it well, because if you can't do it well, then then you might as well not be doing it. So don't be afraid to go seek out some help. Um, you know, we we go do SIV. You, you're signing up for this. Uh, going to see the experts is is uh, is key to success for sure. Um, all right. Spe some things specific to hike and fly. Um, walking on the road sucks, but it's mandatory. Uh, we will do some road walking. Um, it'll start off not too long, you know, an hour or so. And at some point I'll probably have you do a three hour walk on the roads. Uh, not fun, but needs to be done. Um, so, uh, don't shy away from that. Don't skip them every time. Make sure you get it done. So uh, one thing on that note is, um, and it's related to the bottom part with the poles. Some people walking on roads like using poles. Gavin did. I don't. Um, you figure out what works for you. We'll talk about poles in a second for the going uphill, but uh, for the road walking, um, you know, work on, work on what works for you. Um, we're going to do some walking down with the pack. Um, generally a quarter of your training should be down hiking. It sucks and it will make you sore. It's the eccentric part of the movement. Um, but you're going to be faced with a turn point in the mountains and it's not flyable someday. And, uh, you're going to have to walk down and you need to not be scared of it. Um, just needs to be another part of something you've done a million times. So, um, whenever you're looking at the training, if you've got a bad weather, uh, day, um, and you know, there's no hike and fly involved. Uh, that's a good day for you to toss in the down hiking. So, uh, just make sure you keep it, keep it in your, in your kit. 
Um, being efficient is key. And, and part of that is um, in this particular sport is we have two modes um, and we're, we're either trying to move on the ground efficiently or fly through the air efficiently. And on the training side of that, the first one is the transition between the two. So you're packing, you're unpacking uh, is a massive uh, time killer uh, if not done well. And if you haven't, look up Kriegel Mauer packing video or something like that, and you'll see the master showing how it's done. You don't need to do a two minute packing of your wing. That's a, um, he's on another level like he is with everything else, but you should, whenever you have the opportunity, um, take the, or don't take the time, try and lose the time, try and be fast at, at your pack and unpack, you know, have a rhythm to what goes on when, in what sequence, how your stuff comes on and off. It also help you not lose things. Um, because it's all related. You lose something, you got to go back. You just wasted time. Um, and so the more you can train it, the better, uh, the, um, we all know the, the guy, or maybe it's even been us at times where, you know, an hour after landing, they're still packing. Um, that's not going to work in hike and fly racing. So, uh, put some effort in there. Um, do some hiking with, uh, your wing rosetted around your shoulder. That is one of the most unfun parts of hike and fly racing. It's like putting like a big heat blanket around your neck. Uh, but you never know where th that might be useful. And, you know, in the Academy, I don't think we're, we're not expecting or hoping you're going to be doing a bunch of technical slope landing, but what you might find is you go to do a launch and either you blow it and have to move, or you might figure out you set up in the wrong place. And the best one's actually a hundred meters away. Well, 100 meters of vertical uh, is pretty far, but by the time you pack and unpack, if you could have just rosetted it up and, and walked up the hill, you'd have been faster. So worth pra practicing um, and, and understanding how you can move with your harness banging you in the back of the legs and, and the, the wing around your neck. So work on that kind of stuff. Um, and then finally, if you don't hike with poles uh, with the pack, you need to. Um, all the studies show up to a 30% efficiency gain. You do actually burn more calories, which is interesting. So there is a, a energy um, requirement to train with poles, and it's because you're using your upper body. Uh, but it doesn't show a detriment in endurance pace. So it's it's really just a, a kind of overall fueling thing. So um, uh, you will not move well in the mountains without a set of poles with a pack on. So if you don't have them, go get them. Questions on this one? What What's the bullet about know your clothing, like your shoes specifically? Like, what are you meaning by that? Um, kind of that efficiency is key where I say, um, uh, you shouldn't show up with, a new pair of shoes that you don't know that fit right. Okay. You um, should have a set of clothing that you've trained in in different weather environments so that you know on a certain day with certain temp that you need to wear this. Um, that's kind of what I was getting there with that. Okay. And Ben, the pull thing, uh, is there like a degree or slope angle where that number comes into play? I know you were saying like roads is negligible or something. Oh, for the poles? Is that what you said? Your, your opinion was different for like, like flat ground with poles. Yeah. Um, the On flat ground with poles, it's a matter of, of taste, um, but it does not show to have any uh, efficiency gains on that at all. It's just on, I don't know what the slope angle is, but, you know, kind of think. Not, not uh, very much. Not very much, yeah. On the uh, subject of efficiency, running versus, or I guess jogging versus hiking on flat ground, is it waste of energy in your opinion or time saver? Um, I'm going to answer this a bunch of different ways. Um, it depends on 
first, hundred percent depends on you. So if you are not very fit, um, then running's going to crater you pretty quickly. And I would say, don't do much of it at all. Um, the more fit you are and the more of a runner you are, the more it's a tool that can be used for sure. Um, and then the other parts of that are duration of race is massively important. So we're doing a three day stage race. That means you got to go pretty hard. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't surprise me that everyone would find it appropriate to do some running with packs at times in uh, a three-day stage race. Um, if you're doing the X Alps and it's day nine, you're probably not doing a lot of running at that point because you're probably smoked. Um, so, you know, we're going to train some. Um, my advice, because again, this is not, this is a generic basically program I'm writing for the masses, not for the individual if you you should take some of the road days and do some running with your pack and see how you do one thing that you can totally do and that i've used before is you know you might run for a mile walk for two run for a mile walk for two and that can be um very efficient and and not totally beat the crap out of you and i think where it's important is um is if there's a reason, there's a goal, it's not just time, but it's like, I need to get to here before the day turns off so I can get in the air so I can fly. Because if I do that, I'm going to make 40 more kilometers. That's a good reason to go push. Um, if, if you're like just hiking to goal and you know, you got two more days of racing and you're trying to fight for the 18th place instead of the 19th place i might advise you just walk your happy ass in and and feel better tomorrow does that does that make sense yeah thank you all right long days simulation and deep base um that is a photo of mr mcclurg on the last day of the 2000 feet 15 X Alps after having walked for a hundred and some kilometers uh, right before we walked up this non-existent trail and um, and then he had this horrible flight in the heat and yada yada but uh, that's after 100k overnight no sleep at the end of a very long race I put that in there uh, because he was able to achieve that because we had done so many days of a very long training and, and you can't fake uh, long days. It only comes one way, which is getting out there and, and being outside for three hours and six hours and nine hours. Um, so the long day is sacred. Um, if you take your week of training, I normally call it the long day, but if I don't, you can just look at the time associated with it. That's the one you got to find time for. Um, and it's it it's more important to get that done and and skip something else uh, than the other way around. Um, and you just it can't be overstressed in these long endurance events. You've got to train long to go long. Um, and you go, okay, well, how long is long? Because again, I'm gonna put some generic stuff down, but you might want to add or subtract from whatever I give to start with about 90% of what you're capable of in a, um, I'll call it a comf you know, comfortable way, meaning you shouldn't come out of it, you know, unable to, to train for the next five days, about 90% of whatever that is <clears throat> for you is a good place to start your long day. Um, so if for instance, you know, you did a three hour workout and you were destroyed for two days afterwards, that's too long. Um, but maybe at two hours you finish, you're pretty tired, everything hurts, but you can get up the next day and, and you're not perfect, but you can keep going. That's a good place to start. Uh, you're kind of like long, uh, training, um, training days. 
And then you just build from there. There's nothing real simple about or complicated about that. We just keep adding uh, and and you'll get better. Um, what do they do? It said they improve your aerobic base, your muscular endurance, connective tissues. And then they make you figure out that you have horrible posture while walking, um, that your nutrition sucks, um, that you don't know how to take care of your feet, um, that your shorts that you love are chafing, um, that you require half as much water as you thought you did and you've been drowning yourself and that you don't sleep enough or whatever. I just gave you all the negatives, but we don't really see the holes in our training until, or the holes in our, our lifestyle um, until we do some long training days. So make sure those get done. Um, simulations, uh, Gavin's talked about the, the usefulness for him in the X Alps. And, and I've heard that from all of the athletes. Um, and what we're going to do are some, you want to do some multi-day training. Obviously, if you're doing the X Alps, your simulations are going to be longer and harder than they are for the Academy of the X Red Rock. So, um, but what we what we will do in the lead up is we will do one and two day kind of pseudo races um, that you'll do at home, and you'll have to go find the time and find the place to do it. And and I will give you the you know kind of wake up, do this, start at this time. And you're going to go out there for 12 hours um, or eight hours or whatever we decide. And they, they again, like the long days, they really show you um, uh, what you need to improve on and, and, the, and where you've got your game dialed. The difference in a simulation from just a long training day is we're going to put in the navigation piece. You're going to need to use your apps. Hopefully, you're going to go flying. Um, so look out for those. They're super important and they make showing up at the race so much less daunting, knowing that you have already done something like that. Um, the other awesome way to do simulations is to do other racing. So nothing beats racing. Unfortunately in America, we don't have a ton of hike and fly races, but if you can get onto one of Logan's races, um, somehow you can wind up in Europe. Great. It all adds up. And the more you race, the better you race. Um, I think Gavin can attest to this. The simulations, don't be frustrated by them afterwards. It's amazing how they tend to suck almost worse than racing. And people are always like, man, that was so hard. And it's not that you're not trained or not ready, um, but you're in the middle of training. So uh, you tend to go into simulations fatigued, unlike before the red rocks where we're going to have tapered you and gotten you plenty of rest. And so you'll be feeling, uh, ready to go to the point of like wanting to go train it, the simulation will be different because it'll be right in the middle of training. Um, so you tend to be pretty smashed and, and just don't overthink that. Keep your head up and then just keep driving on. Um, deep base. For those of you who have a long training history, it matters. Um, and if you have a short training history, it matters too. Um, and it's, I, I just put that in there is just for you to be aware of it. So, um, if you have a big endurance background and even if you've been sedentary for a while, it'll come back pretty fast. If you have none, you also just need to temper your expectations, work hard and realize that, um, like really quality gifted endurance athletes are built in years and years and years and not in months. Um, and you can get plenty ready to do this race. Um, uh, but there's a whole level of, of fitness that's not going to come, uh, quickly. So, uh, just wanted to make sure that was on everyone's radar. Any questions on long days? Uh, self-care. So, um, that self-care really is the, the gamut of, of, you know, kind of everything you could think of. Um, you know, you always want to grab the low hanging fruit, um, and do the easy stuff and make sure you're always doing it the best of your ability. And, and that's getting decent sleep. Um, and it's eating well and, 
we're going to have a nutrition talk in a little bit, but you know, the basics are of nutrition is uh, no matter what kind of eater you are, whether you're a vegan, a meat eater, a vegetarian, whatever you are, you want to eat whole foods as much as you can. And you don't want to eat a bunch of processed crap. And that's, that's the single most important part of nutrition and, and everything else is, is just degrees of, of better. Um, so you want to eat sleep, you want to eat well, um, and then you want to take care of your body. You're going to be beating it up and I'm going to give you mobility work, um, directed. You can throw that in the trash if you have your own program and do what you normally do. Um, but what it's going to be is, is some directed stretching and self-massage daily. Um, I like to do mine at the end of the day. Like when I'm watching TV, you can do it right after you work out. You can do it in the morning. It doesn't really matter. It's, it's there to help you uh, recover from training and to um, get a better body overall. Um, and so, you, like I said, we're going to do stretching, self-massage. We're going to take you into those uh, uh the the kind of limits of the range of motion so it's like sitting in the bottom of the squat um you know really getting long uh doing some some stretches and that that's important to set yourself up um to to be able to train well and have some of that explosiveness um and be able to move uh the way you're supposed to move and if you're tight all the time you're not going to move well um and then the other one is that you can work on is, is I, I say, stimulus, stimulation and desensitizing. Um, there's areas of our body that can get inflamed or sensitive. And the more we work on them and mash them and massage them, uh, they get less sensitive and then they don't get inflamed. So um, uh, smashing parts of your body with a lacrosse ball or a massage gun is a good thing. And, and you need to do plenty of it. Um, under there, I put yoga, the ready state. That's a website that uh, uh, our, my stretching will basically, its reference is coming out of the ready state. Again, you don't need to use it. Pliability is another one that gives directed stretching, like 20 minute sessions a day that works really well. Uh, you can go to a rolfer, you can go to a massage therapist, Compex, which is the, the electrical stimulation stuff. All that is good. So figure out what works for you makes you happy and that you will comply with and then make sure you do it um i say tissue should not be sensitive if you whenever you massage something if it's really sore then it's an angry muscle and it needs more massage um tissue should be fairly supple and should be happy when you massage it if it hurts then keep going um I said, sitting is killing you, stand more. Uh, you know, anyone who works in any kind of job that requires them to sit, uh, it's it's so bad for you, it's ridiculous. I'm not going to go on a sermon of standing desks, but you, you need to get up, you need to move. If you're going to do this training, try not to have it be, you know, 21 hours of sitting every day and um, or sitting or sleeping, and then a couple hours of working out. Try and get up, move around, stand up, work standing as much as you can. It really will help you. And then the last note there is uh, like almost every problem I see starts with people's hips. Um, so tight hips, which come from sitting, uh, they lead to knee problems, they lead to hip problems, they lead to foot problems, low back. It all starts in the hips. Um, we're going to have stretches that you're going to do and you're going to figure out, damn, my hips are tight. And all I can say is then the stretching I'm giving you should be a starting point. If you figure out your hips are jacked up, keep working on them because it will matter when we're doing the training. Um, you'll be able to train harder and longer uh, if you get your hips right. Um, and then the last one, we're going to do three to five week blocks. And then we do a recovery week um, and that's like half volume and half the intensity and more rest days. And it's super important. Um, so whether you do this training, you're training on your own, make sure you're putting in those rest weeks. Like we talked about earlier, that's where your fitness and adaptation is going to come from. 
Um, and uh, if you don't, you're you're almost wasting your time with your training because it it will not be as effective if you don't rest. So make sure that gets done. Questions on this one? All right. Consistency, like we talked about before, um, frequent training is better than harder training. Um, so trying to get to that five days a week um, to six days a week is important. Um, if you have to choose, life's busy, do the sports specific training before you say do the gym training. Obviously, you shouldn't do that for too much straight, but on a given week, if you need to make some tough choices, um, always go with the sports specific stuff as, as the priority. Um, you know, I'm a super busy person. I got two kids, a couple jobs, work all the time. And the only way I make training work is like, I have a plan. You should go to bed knowing what you're doing tomorrow, where you're going to train, how it's going to work out you know, Sunday, the week for the next week, move the training around ahead of time. Because if you make a plan, you're so much more likely to get it done. And if you don't, and you just think, oh, I'll figure it out, you won't figure it out. Um, you won't be prepared for the training, your gear won't be ready, you'll waste time. Um, so have a plan. It's the only way you're going to be consistent. Um, and if you're busy, well, Shouldn't have signed up for the race, I guess. Um, you know, go to bed early and wake up early. Train in the dark. Um, I do it plenty. I know a lot of other people that do it plenty. I've got athletes that are, you know, ER docs that that train at four o'clock in the morning every day. It can be done. Um, and you just got to make it a priority. So do what you need to do. Um, I say excuses are like assholes. Um, so don't be an asshole train um and then the, the other one in there is uh modified training is better no training i it i often get uh athletes who are like oh well i couldn't do x it's like well could you have done half of it well yeah well then do half if it's a 60 minute hike and all you have is 30 minutes get after it get your 30 and no regrets move on so don't be afraid to shorten the training change the training the best thing is that you're actually training. Um, a great tip is I said, be prepared for spontaneous training. Um, I keep a pair of running shoes and running shorts in my car so that at any time I can just go train, um, take the kid to, you know, soccer game and they have an hour warm up. Normally I'm going to go run for that hour because it's somewhere in my calendar. I can do training. Um, so if you get white space in your calendar, uh, make it a habit. Go train, go do some exercise, go work on your mobility. Uh, maybe do that and not go play a video game or, you know, watch TV or whatever. Um, and then this last one, back to the planning thing, poor food, alcohol, sleep choices can ruin the next day of training. Um, we all should have lives. So I'm not saying don't go have fun. Try and be smart. And if you know that Friday nights are your night to go crush the world, uh, I would not make the most important training day Saturday because you're going to wake up not crushing the world. You're just going to be crushing a hangover. So, um, you know, make the training fit your life and you don't need to have an unfun life. Just make good choices about when and how you train and it'll it'll come together. That being said, um, you know, obviously the more improvements you can see on that food, alcohol, sleep thing, uh, the better overall your train is going to be. And then we all know it's just the better way you're going to feel. Um, there's support systems. There's apps that can help with food tracking, booze tracking. Depending on what kind of person you are, some of that stuff can be uh, super helpful. Um, if you feel like you're getting to a spot where you need any uh, advice on how to deal with some of that, give me a shout. And, and I've got some, some stuff that I've used myself and with, with, uh, other people that, that I've found to be fairly effective.
questions on consistency? Cool. Uh, wrap up. There's Eduardo at the X Pier. Talk less, do more. Um, it's a good way to be. Uh, I'm talking too much, so we'll definitely wrap it up. But, um, you know, overall, just to, you know, looking at a summary is, is, um, it's, there's no special sauce. Uh, there's no magic training's hard work. It's consistency. It's, it's just a linear progression of do a little more than you did the week before and then take some rest. Um, you know, the big thing you get with training programs, whether it's this one or, or someone else's, a lot of times just the accountability piece, the actual training is not magical. Um, uh, and so, you know, the magic comes from you, which is doing the work. And if you do the work, then you're going to see results. Um, before we go look at uh, the first week of training peaks, uh, good time for general questions. If anyone has any left. I would just say that if you're intimidated by anything that Ben just said, you, you shouldn't be. You're, you know, if you haven't done this, you're embarking on something that's incredibly awesome. And it just like you said, it makes it a lot more fun by just doing the work. I, I think the most important part of having a trainer, especially somebody as good as Ben, is it just it it has the accountability. And so it removes the if you're one of the types of people that does too much or one of the types of people who finds excuses, then it'll remove a lot of that. And I can tell you from doing all the training I have from Ben, he makes it wicked fun and training is awesome. It's just such a privilege. So uh, if it is hard sometimes to find the time, we're all adults and we have stuff going on, but <clears throat> it, you know, you could really look forward to this. I wouldn't be too intimidated by this. You'll be stoked. And You'll have an, an amazing summer and it'll make you a better human and a better pilot and more robust. Ben's seen me crash a lot over there in the Alps and I've walked away from all of them, knock on wood. No doubt. Yeah. No, I mean, that's the thing. It, it is fun. Um, it, it's, uh, you know, not every day you're going to want to do it, but most days you should be stoked to go train and the feeling you get when you're done, um, uh, you know, can carry you the rest of the day. So um, let me see if I can get, go ahead. Yeah, thanks for throwing this together, guys. Um, about acclimatization, if you could just mention just a couple comments. If you're training at sea level um, and say you don't have the luxury of necessarily training at altitude before the race, should you should you consider modifying your training program so that you could potentially, when you get up to altitude, I think Monroe is at 5,400 feet. Uh, I think uh, Monroe Peak is like eleven thousand, right? So, any any guidance, any advice you can give to those of us at sea level training at sea level, that'd be that'd be helpful. Um, the the best thing would be to try and get out there a week ahead of time. I hate to say it, but um, that's that's the that would be your number one goal if somehow you could you know get into some altitude uh, that week before you can make a lot of, uh, progress on that front in a reasonably short amount of time. The, <clears throat> the training aspect of living where you're at, unfortunately, like, like those masks and stuff, they've proven to not be effective. Um, because you're just, you're not, you're just changing the diameter of, it's like sucking air through a straw, uh, which is not actually what's happening at altitude. So um, I wouldn't advise using one of those. Um, I think you should try hard to do a couple of um, uh, trips, I guess is the best way I could phrase that, to get into the mountains. Um before the race and that you know that's useful too because you can do your simulations you could do some long days what part of the the flat world are you living in i'm in la so I yeah so, so one of these big peaks in the background and yeah 
I mean, that's your answer. You just need to go get in the mountains and they're there and you don't, obviously it's ideal if you're sleeping at, you know, five, six, 7,000 feet, but it's not critical. What's critical is that you go get some training in the mountains and that'll uh, pay some pretty big dividends. Okay, cool. And then at least a week at altitude if you can. Yeah, if you can, it'll help a lot. Yep. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah, thanks, Ben. Sure. Cool. Uh, let me see if I can get this to work now. You guys can see that. Yep. Right. So scroll down here. Your guys' view will look a tiny bit different because mine is um uh uh the coaches edition. So Wesley, you're on here. So everyone and we're still looking. just looking at the PowerPoint, or at least I am. Okay, you're still just looking at the PowerPoint. Good. Now let me figure out what the hell is going on here. Old Zoom. Okay. New share. Uh huh. There we go. Boom. Ah, can you see that now? Look like training peaks. Yep. yep. Perfect. Cool. Um. All right. So. Uh, like I said, yours will look a tiny bit different, but for the most part, it'll look like this. The way this works is I write the training to the X Red Rocks Academy plan, and it just goes out to all of you who have signed up. Um, so you all get the exact same uh, set of workouts. Um, it You have an app on your phone. There's an iPad app. This is the desktop version. It's all fairly intuitive. Um, first thing is you're getting the basic subscription. Your first week is they give you premium for free. So you're going to have some functionality the first week that then disappears. The basic edition allows you to look at the workouts, open them manually, enter results and move on. Totally fine. Right. Half my athletes use the basic. If you want to be able to physically move the workouts around like this, because you want to change your day. Um, if you want to sync your watch to auto upload results, um, and there's some other things, then you want to sign up for premium. It's it has nothing to do with me. I don't, I have no affiliation with these guys, uh, but you're paying them, I think like 12 bucks a month or something like that. So totally your call, uh, do whatever works for you. Um, in the notes section is I'll kind of give you the you know general gist of what we're doing this week if i think there's anything important i'll note it there if i think there's a particular workout that's the most important i'll note it there um uh in this particular week i basically say what i just told you i also show you uh the mobility work i give you the website the ready state um there's also a book called becoming a supple leopard you could buy the book or you could reference the website and that's how you'll do the the mobility work. Cause I'll say something like Olympic wall squat. And you're like, what the hell is an Olympic wall squat? It's in supple leopard or in the ready state. So that's your reference guide for the mobility stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's the note version. And then you'll notice you have B group and a group B is for beginner. A is for advanced. Um, and that is relevant to you, meaning it doesn't actually mean advanced. That's not like the Kriegel Mauer group and then the couch potato group. It's just one's harder than the other. You can look at it. You can decide you're doing all B group. You can decide you're doing all A group. You can actually jump back and forth. It's kind of up to you because you may have some strength and weaknesses. A very good example would be if you've been a gym rat, then you should certainly do the A group strength workouts. And you might need to start with the B group hiking because you haven't been outside much. Um, so you're all adults, make good decisions and, and go from there. Um, so if we click on B group baseline hike, it says with your hike and fly kit, hike 1,000 to 1,500 feet. Whenever I say that, I'm talking vertical feet um, on a trail that you can repeat. or 
if you have no access to trails, 60 minutes on an incline trainer or stair master. And then I said, you'll do this in effort six out of 10. Um, most of the workouts are going to be written somewhat like that. I'm either going to give you um, a time or a distance or a vertical feet or a combination thereof, but you got to read it. Like, so it says duration one hour. That doesn't mean quit at one hour. I just put something approximating in there. What I want is what's written there, which is to hike a thousand to 1500 feet. Does that, does that make sense? Um, so then when you're done, you go into completed, won't let me do it. Cause I'm not you. And you type in how long it actually took and you go to elevation gain and you manually type it in. Or if you have your watch synced to training peaks, you use a Sun to Garmin, Apple Watch works. It'll just throw all the statistics in there and you don't need to put in any of that stuff. There's the post activity comments, super helpful for you, for me, for all, just to, to jot down a note like, oh, that was easier than I thought, or, you know, this pair of shoes suck or whatever. Um, make some notes. They're great for you to go reference. I will be kind of checking in on you guys throughout the week um, and comments are great because, you know, this, this is not custom training. It's not directed programming. Um, you're not going to get the kind of feedback my, um, my uh, other athletes do, but I will be checking in on you. And if there's some comments that might make me want to reach out and tell you to, you know, do something different or make a change, um, it could be helpful to you. So don't be afraid to use the comments box. Um, so that was B, A, same workout, 2,000 to 3,000 feet or 90 minutes on an incline trainer. So it's just, in this instance, it's longer um, because what I'm figuring for the A group is that you have more of a history. And so you can go attack a 3,000 foot hike uh, and it's not going to break you. If you have very little hiking history, start with the easier one. Um, and like I said, there's nothing that says you can't move from B to A group halfway through the, the training or just stick with it. You will see good progression either way. You really want to put yourself where you should be, uh, not where um, you might want to be. So, uh, And then here's your mobility work. Two minutes abductor smash, two minutes super patella smash, three minutes couch stretch, two minute calf stretch. Uh, that's supposed to be smash and then two minutes calf stretch. So these are all terms um, that are in the book Supple Leopard or you can find on the Ready State. And honestly, most of it, you can just type into Google and we'll probably bring it up. So um, that's how the uh, mobility works. Let's take a quick look at a strength day. Um, so this is a very beginner strength work. If you've done none, I'd start here. Um, you can see I have links to um, some of the movements. Some of the movements I might not give links to because I think they're self-explanatory, like a plank hold. Um, if you're still confused, uh, use Google. It's your friend. There are links for every exercise on planet Earth. Um, some of them, if I do put a link in, do watch them. Like the lunge one is an example. Most people lunge poorly and they do it wrong. And so I put this link in here because it has a great tutorial from some smart people on how to lunge co correctly. So if there is a link, take a look. It'll, it'll help you out. Um, so that was mostly, that was all something... Everything in here can be done on your living room floor. No, no accessories needed. Um, this is a workout for someone who knows their way around the gym. Uh, there's going to be some kettlebell swings. There's some pull-ups. Uh, there's some step-ups onto a box. There's some bent over rows with dumbbells. So if, if you want to get interested in the gym, you should go this route. Or if you are already comfortable in the gym, you should go this route. So uh, totally up to you. So that's kind of an example of, or not kind of, that is the example of what your guys' first week is, is going to be like. Um, you'll notice on Thursday, it says both A and B rest. So everyone needs to take a rest day. 
Then on Sunday, it says B rest only, and then A has a workout. So that's important because if you are um, uh, kind of new to training, I'm wanting you to intentionally to take two rest days a week. And if you're already well into training, you're only getting one rest day a week. Um, so those are there on purpose and, and good things to, to notice. Um, has anyone jumped on since you guys signed up? I've got 16 people, I think, on Training Peaks now uh, from this group. Has anyone jumped on and, and been able to navigate it? And this is actually showing up correctly. Yep. Yep. Cool. I, I think I have to figure out how to upload and enter the workouts when they happen, but I'll get there. Yeah, it's it's once you get it set up, it's it's nice. It, it just takes all your thought away. uh let's see yeah i think that was it any any questions on training peaks is there a community aspect to training peaks like to see how everyone else is doing in it or is it just uh you and the coach well you know that's a that's an interesting question that i don't have an answer to at the moment because i've never actually done the this group program i always do the individuals um and I'm trying to see here. I think what, well, I don't have an answer to that question. We could also consider doing a academy telegram group for, you know, moral support questions. Uh, for instance, someone may ask a question, I may answer it, and then everyone gets the answer would be kind of nice. Um, you, would you guys like to do that? Yeah, I'd be keen. I think we're all going to be different levels. Some guys have trained for races, some haven't. Um, I know I do better when I see how good my buddies are doing and I need to get my ass in gear. So I know I would ben benefit from it personally, but. Yep. Yeah, I don't, I'll have to do some research and I'll let you know if we, if, if that's a, if sharing via training peaks is possible, I don't actually know. And if not, if, if nothing else, we should do a little, a chat group for sure. Uh, yeah. Questions, comments, thoughts, ideas. Ben, you might might want to. Uh, you you're might be too nice for this, but I, so I should say it. But I guess everybody should understand what this kind of training comes with and what maybe more importantly what it doesn't you know that this you don't get to just call ben all the time and ask him questions with this program you can imagine that would be you know this is 200 bucks for five months of training that just doesn't work he's a busy guy so um i don't know you might want to comment on that ben this yeah yeah that that so what's different is like Alejandro's on here and you know, he's one of, he's, he's been doing custom training with me for a long time. Um, you know, he can send me a telegram anytime, anywhere. And, um, I answer it. We've got a phone call in two days. Um, that's what that type of training gets you, uh, to your point. Um, that's not what this is. It, it really is. I'm going to give you guys my best look at at what good training is for a group and then it's really you guys running with it um like i said i'll i'll check in if i see any general trends i'll make notes um if there's a something wrong i want to know about it like i don't know i thought i filled in a day and it's blank or something but um um it's you're you're getting a very different uh, product with this. Um, I think the train is going to be awesome and you're going to see good benefits, but I won't be there holding your hand for sure. Cool. Um, I generally try and get the train up by Saturday every once in a while, it'll be up by Sunday. Um, and, um, uh, we'll see how it goes the more you guys put uh, results in, the more I can see if I need to uh, add or change what I'm doing. Um, so uh, feedback in the app is good. So even if I'm not talking to you directly, um, I can see if I see that, you know, 
everybody in the B group is, you know, commenting that it's too hard or too easy, then I might, you know, adjust that group's training. So uh, please, please leave feedback uh, in training peaks. Um, yeah. So I think the other important thing, Gavin, is, uh, you know, this is the academy and this is the second now and uh, we've got more to come. Yeah, we're going to do a whole bunch of these, everybody. So uh, stay tuned. But that was great, Ben. Thanks, man. Right on. Yeah. Thanks for everyone for tuning in. Um, yeah, I'm stoked to to see how you guys do. I think it's I think it's going to be well worth uh, a you guys doing the training, and it's just going to make this whole event more fun. Um, uh, you guys feeling prepared and ready to rip. So. Y'all too. Uh, if if there's a uh, use that chat channel for any kind, you know, the rest of the webinar series, we have it kind of mapped out, but this is from our perspective and maybe not yours. And so if there, if there are aspects of this race coming up that make you more nervous than others, and you'd like, for example, foot care to be the next one versus hydration, nutrition, something, whatever, all the different topics that we're going to cover, we should probably just put out a list at some point of all the things we're planning on it. And then, but if there's, if there's stuff that's, man, I really need to know about X, let us know. And we'll, we'll, we'll jump that one up in the stack. Cool. Yeah, we'll do. Cool. Thanks everybody. Thanks for everything. It's awesome. Thank you for right on. Thank you very much. Awesome. You're going to love it. All right, we'll talk to you guys soon.